Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG Foundation, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJTV News. Anchoring tonight is Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and welcome to NJTV News. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Thanks for joining us tonight. Health experts are using a new term as we prepare to enter cold and flu season, a twindemic. It's a dreaded scenario that threatens our health care system with battling both COVID-19 and our usual cases of the flu. Yes, you can be infected with both. In a recent interview, CDC Director Robert Redfield warned this fall could be the worst ever for public health, calling on the public to help keep the outbreak under control. New Jersey State Epidemiologist Dr. Tina Tan joins me now to explain what's ahead. Dr. Tan, how concerned are you about the convergence of influenza and COVID-19? We are definitely concerned about the possible convergence of flu and COVID-19. We recognize that um, even though flu is unpredictable, we anticipate to see its emergence again, you know, every single year that it does, as it does in New Jersey and nas nationally. Um, you know, our concern is that, um, you know, COVID-19 and influenza present as very similar illnesses. So we want to make sure that we try to do as best as possible to prevent influenza illnesses because we have a flu vaccine. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk, of course, about how intense this flu season might be. Do we have any indication uh, what we might be up against and what we can do? The thing that's predictable about flu is that it's unpredictable. It's really hard to predict how um, severe the season might be, how long the season might be, who might be impacted, because again, it depends on how uh, flu circulates in our community. Um, you know, we do know, for example, that every year there's always uh, new, uh, uh, new issues and new flu strains that uh, do circulate. Last year was unusual because it was a type B predominant uh, uh, flu season that more impacted younger people, for example. So we'll have to see how things look. What type of threat does that pose to our healthcare systems? Well, you know, we want to try to minimize the number of flu infections because flu infections can lead to hospitalizations. And we want to try to minimize flu hospitalizations because we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic that there was definitely a strain on the healthcare systems, particularly during the, uh, the peak of the COVID uh, pandemic here in New Jersey. So anything that we can do to minimize hospitalizations from other causes such as vaccine preventable respiratory illnesses like flu, uh, the more that we can preserve our scarce resources in the healthcare sector. The health commissioner said that the state is securing more doses of the flu vaccine. Is it possible to have both the coronavirus and the flu at the same time? It is possible to be infected with both the viruses that cause flu and COVID-19. There's still a lot of evidence and data that is being analyzed about this. So to that end, you know, again, because we actually do have an FDA approved vaccine for flu, getting that flu vaccine will prevent you from getting uh, flu and potentially prevent the uh, possibility of co-infection. Let me ask you about all the talk of this saliva-based test that was developed by Rutgers University that can detect for both of those. Um, is it true that we may see this, this test evolve and, and how quickly might we be able to use it? There is definitely a lot of promising technology out there right now um, where we can test for both flu and for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And, um, you know, we're anxiously following all those technologies and the different platforms that, uh, that are going to be coming to uh, market and uh, uh, becoming available for providers to use. Um, you know, we are certainly looking forward to technologies that will allow for quicker testing um, and also uh, quicker results. Dr. Tina Tan, thanks for your time as always. Thank you, Brianna. 
Bottom line, according to Dr. Tan, get a flu shot and don't become complacent. Today, the state reported 302 new positive coronavirus cases. The statewide cumulative total is more than 188,000. That's with eight new fatalities, pushing the confirmed and probable deaths to just shy of 16,000. Hospitalizations are at a five-month low, while the rate of transmission holds steady just above one. Those improvements mean it's game on for outdoor high school sports like field hockey and football. The state's Interscholastic Athletic Association today released return to play guidelines. Outdoor practices will begin September 14th, but indoor sports, those are still on hold. Volleyball and gymnastics seasons are being postponed to a special season starting in February. Another big change in the association's plan is out of state competitions. Those are off except for quote, exceptional circumstances. The state's attempt to create flexibility for school reopenings has caused a lot of confusion. Parents are trying to sort their kids' schedules for remote and hybrid plans. Many districts are waiting on guidance from the Murphy administration over whether they have permission to start the year virtually and just how to do it. NJ Spotlight founding editor and education reporter John Mooney joins me with the latest. John, here we are. It's late August, and it seems like schools are still scrambling to figure out plans and what they're going to do. Yes, um, you know, Governor Murphy's option of, of allowing districts to go all remote uh, gave them some flexibility, but it also gave them another hoop to jump through uh, in terms of those who wanted to do it, in terms of a process. They, ha they have to submit to the state a plan for how they would go remote, why they need to go remote and a plan for how they can eventually meet the standards. And the guidance for that a week later has still not come out. So uh, I think there's a lot of districts, and I've seen different numbers, but certainly more than 100, 150 districts that want to at least start remote. And they have nothing really to a pipeline to go into to be reviewed. So here we are two weeks out. Uh, still a lot of questions for districts, obviously for families who have to follow. Uh, these edicts and, and you know they're, they're, they're getting a little antsy I would say is a, a fair description. Not as easy as just saying we don't want to do it. Weren't state lawmakers supposed to step in here? What happened with yeah, that? Yeah they were. There was a bill again a couple weeks ago that came out of the assembly that would have required all schools to start remotely or give them an option just to delay opening uh, that looked like it had some early momentum and then uh, it seems that uh, the political appetite sort of wound down with Murphy coming out and saying that was an option and a general belief that they didn't think Murphy would ever sign it. Uh, so that, bo that bill is not pulled entirely, but it was not taken up under consideration today when it was supposed to or expected to be. Very quickly, I know you covered the State Board of Education meeting and we heard from a new representative, a student representative, yes? Yeah, um, Sabrina from Seneca High School down in Tabernacle, Burlington County. Um, She's a student representative on the board, and usually they give a statement that is pretty routine and not all that exciting, and yesterday um, she gave her opening statement and talked about what the toll is on kids and, and what they've lost and what they don't feel they're going to get back, uh, including you know the toll on their mental health. It was, it was powerful and compelling. It was, I'm glad she spoke up. Yeah, we'll have to see if that uh, makes a difference. John Mooney, good to check in with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brianna. For more on the student plea made to the State Board of Ed, check out John's full story on njspotlight.com. Senator Kamala Harris made history last night, formally accepting the Democratic nomination for vice president. She is the first woman of color to join a major party ticket. Night three of the DNC tackled issues of gun violence, climate change, and immigration. Former President Barack Obama took the gloves off with a sharp rebuke on President Trump's time in office, saying Trump is willing to tear our democracy down. Hillary Clinton, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and Senator Elizabeth Warren, three of Trump's biggest opponents took aim at the sitting president, but it was Harris who confronted the administration with some memorable one-liners. I have fought for children and survivors of sexual assault. I fought against transnational criminal organizations. I took on the biggest banks and helped take down one of the biggest for-profit colleges. I know a predator when I see one. 
And you can watch the special primetime coverage of the Democratic National Convention each night on the PBS NewsHour. Tonight, of course, Joe Biden accepts the nomination as president for the Democratic Party. Or check out their YouTube channel, podcasts, and social feeds. Then head to njspotlight.com slash njdecides for all the latest on the November election. Well, Governor Murphy says if offered, he won't accept a position in the Biden administration if the former VP unseats President Trump this fall. In an interview with Politico New Jersey's Matt Friedman, Murphy said he's staying right here. Murphy serves as the chairman of the Democratic Governors Association and has a close relationship with Biden, but noted he wouldn't leave in peacetime or with the current situation we're in. The governor has his hands full cleaning up COVID-19's impact in the state's high-risk prison population, with the disease moving quickly through tight cells and packed jails. New data from the Marshall Project shows New Jersey has the highest rate of coronavirus-related deaths among inmates. Lawmakers are working on a plan to prevent future fatalities if a second wave comes crashing down on the state. Michael Hill reports. Um, I think it's so inhumane. COVID-19 killed Bernice Ferguson's 39-year-old son, Rory Price. He was serving the rest of his three-and-a-half-year sentence for drug and weapons convictions in a halfway house in Bridgeton. In March, Ferguson had urged her son to be careful of contracting the virus. A month later, a phone call. Rory was rushed to the hospital on April 20th. Ferguson says dozens of phone calls yielded no answers. On May 1st, the same month of Price's scheduled prison release, the hospital called. Ferguson learned her son had the virus and it had killed him. You should not be able to get a phone call the day that they pass away saying, I'm sorry for your loss. Well, I can't even tell you how that feels. As of late July, Price is among 50 New Jersey Department of Corrections inmates to die from COVID-19. The Marshall Project reports New Jersey leads the nation with 29 such deaths per 100,000 inmates. It should never have happened. We should have anticipated this. Senator Nellie Poe has written a bill that would expedite the release of most inmates in the last year of serving their full term, crediting them eight months if they have a year left, and if eight or fewer months left, releasing them right away from a system not equipped to practice CDC precautions. And it's highly unlikely that you have that ability to do that while in prison. Prisons weren't designed with physical distancing in mind. They were designed to warehouse people. Um, so with uh, the overcrowding situation in prisons and, uh, and the virus raging, we, we want to make sure that we're doing whatever we can legislatively and, and, and through the governor's office and through the courts to make sure that we're, we're taking steps to protect people and saving lives. The DOC says nearly a thousand inmates have gone home under the governor's pandemic-inspired executive order to increase space in lockups by releasing inmates 60 and older, those at risk, and those whose sentences were close to expiring. He wasn't sentenced to prison, to death. Advocates who staged this mock inmate funeral in May are giving Senator Poe's bill an extra push for passage because the bill looks beyond this pandemic. If some other health crisis, some other outbreak were to occur, this bill would address that as well. We can't take for granted that this will be a one in 100 uh, year situation again. Uh, as we know, like with the climate crisis, we are getting uh, 100 year events every year now. The bill is moving through the legislature with bipartisan support. Senator Poe is confident both chambers will approve it, the governor will sign it, and it will be enacted 15 days later. Way too late for Bernie's Ferguson's son's benefit, but potentially expediting the release of 3,500 other inmates. I think it's an awesome bill because had that taken place when my son was there, um, perhaps my son be still here, he'd be home with me instead of in, in the graveyard. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Well, it was tough to get your hands on proper masks and PPE at the height of this outbreak, and now it's tough to get everyone to use it. In Hoboken, the city council was considering a hefty fine to get residents to comply with wearing masks in public in places where you can't social distance. But members voted down the idea for a $250 penalty at Wednesday night's council meeting. The vote was 3-6 to six against the proposal, despite a survey that showed the overwhelming majority of residents approved of the idea. 
Masks will be one of the requirements on campus this fall as some colleges welcome back students, Montclair State University among them. Students will have to adjust to a new normal, especially as a growing number of reports link COVID clusters to colleges being caused by off-campus parties. No reports at MSU, but how will the school keep everyone safe? Leah Mishkin takes us for a look. She's a twin, so oh, her yeah. sister moved in on Monday, so she's here. She's on the first floor and she's on the sixth floor. Does it stress you as a mom that both your girls are here right now with everything going on? or you're... No, not at all. No, I'm perfectly fine with it. You're living alone? No, I have a roommate, but she's moving in on Saturday. The students who live on campus started coming back the 5th. Uh, classes start on the 25th. Triples and doubles, we have eliminated all of those types of rooms except for doubles where people have asked and we've gone from 5,200 to a little over 3,000. Are these your only two daughters? Yeah, that's it. It's so one shot. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> No, oh. you had no hesitation to maybe do this online and not move into the dorms? No. Or? No. You know, they, you know, they, their senior year of high school was ruined, so, you know, why am I going to rob them of this? You know, if they can go, they're going. The students who live on campus are the ones who would be attending the classes in person? Well, mostly, but commuters also may have a class or two uh, that is in person. And every student, though, does have that option to opt into the online only? Uh, or yeah. does it depend for on the, the course? Part, it depends on their courses. It depends on how they've scheduled. So for instance, if they're taking a lab course, yeah. uh, we did that for the spring. But ideally, lab courses need to be in the classroom. It tells you where to sit and where not to sit. Very far apart. Very far apart. Okay. Oh, and there's shields in place. Mm -hmm. So you're staying tonight? So you're yeah. Out? She's staying. And your sister's here? Yes. It's really yeah. pretty. Yeah. We Thank ended you. up doing the same thing. Wait, your mom really hooked you up. She brought you a lot of food. Oh, yeah. The hot Cheetos. <laughs> I love hot Cheetos. I've been craving them. She's having yeah, a she great time. Them. Yeah? Yeah. The food's good. All right. Oh, it smells so good in here. So I see already these social markers. For the protection of the student as well as our employees, we have plexiglass all along every single station around the facility. You don't see as many um, students in here. Are you limiting the amount that come we in? We are limiting the amount that come in. Eat, sleep, party, sleep. <laughs> yes, I love Sounds to like a eat college sleep. college itinerary right there. <laughs> All these, you know, schools who have parties off campus and that's where a lot of these COVID yeah. clusters are happening. Yeah. Have you spoken about that or? Um, yeah. We are in a little different situation from many of the campuses that are having those parties. We don't have uh, apartments around Montclair. We don't have student housing where those kinds of things happen. We don't have fraternity and sorority houses. So we're hopeful. Were you worried that it might get shut down though when all this is going? I am going? still yeah. worried about that, yeah. That at some point they're just going to say, sorry, we have to yeah. close everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because it could happen. It's, it's already happening, you know, in some schools. Unfortunately, uh, I think it would take something catastrophic. Just see what happens. Just wait and see. That was Leah Mishkin reporting. Colleges may be on the rebound, but is our economy? Rhonda Schaffler is here with the latest jobs numbers and today's top business news. Rhonda. Brianna, we have some signs the job market is getting better in New Jersey. In July, the state's unemployment rate fell to 13.8 percent. Now, that is still historically a very high number, but the rate is coming down. New Jersey has now regained about 341,000 jobs since April. The state Labor Department says that's 41 percent of the jobs lost due to the coronavirus pandemic. But there is still a long, long way to go. Since March, nearly one and a half million New Jersey residents have had to file for unemployment benefits. In the latest week, another 25,000 plus residents filed for first time claims. And the state Labor Department says that reverses a two week decline. Nationally, more than a million workers filed for first time jobless claims. That was higher than expected. With chance of tax the rich, demonstrators gathered in Marlton to call on the state to end tax breaks for the wealthy. Progressive groups released a report called Pandemic Profiteers. It names New Jersey millionaires and companies they say have gotten richer during the pandemic. Louis DePaulo is with New Jersey Policy Perspective. 
millionaires and billionaires and big corporations like Freedom Mortgage are amassing record wealth and record profits on the backs of their workers and their communities. They are not paying their fair share. Meantime, some of those same groups are asking for more transparency in the state's budget process. Public hearings on the new budget have yet to be scheduled. NJ Spotlight's John Reitmeyer says New Jersey has a reputation for making tough budget decisions behind closed doors. The concern is that this year, with the stakes of an ongoing pandemic, potential tax increases, potential borrowing, that this is the year that that should be, uh, that practice should be broken. You can read John's story on njspotlight.com. New Brunswick-based J&J is about to launch the largest late-stage clinical trial to date for a potential coronavirus vaccine. According to the Wall Street Journal, 60,000 people will participate. Now here's a check on Wall Street. I'm Rhonda Schaffler and those are your top business stories. After the pandemic hit, almost all of our favorite activities got sidelined. Live music and concerts, those were silenced, but leave it to artists to find ways to connect with their audiences. First virtually and now through socially distant concerts. Could this be the way forward during a COVID-19 era? Senior correspondent David Cruz is on the beat. Artists are some of the biggest heroes of 2020, in my opinion. It's going to take more than a global pandemic to stop the music. All across the state, with the coronavirus shuttering music venues, large and small, programmers and musicians scramble to find a way to present to live audiences. At the Count Basie Theater for the Arts in Red Bank, this was supposed to be a great summer after a $28 million renovation. But then, you know, corona. Yeah, not, uh, not something you typically plan for when, when building a $25, $30 million expansion, including a second venue. But we know that there's a need um, and a desire and a, a craving for the arts in the community. Um, so we put our heads together with a few different partners to, uh, to see what we can do, what, what spaces were out there. The solution, two sites in Monmouth Park, outdoors at the Blue Grotto Restaurant, and here in the parking lot for a series called Drive-In Live. Uh, we kicked it off with Southside Johnny and the Jukes and Jim Gaffigan back in early July, and we can do about 900 cars over there. The Morris Museum was facing a similar dilemma. In July, as music began to return, Brett Messenger, who programs live events at the museum, stalked the grounds looking for inspiration. And our elevated parking deck behind the museum suddenly just appeared as this perfect venue for music and soon theater. And so I spent several evenings with my good friend sitting there, moving our chairs around with the tape measure, figuring out a seating chart, how we could do this safely, responsibly. And then once I was sure we could do that, I started calling musicians I know. And after several jazz shows, including two sellouts, the museum began its Lot of Strings series. <laughs> audience. There was a standing ovation. They poured out of the parking lot and with such joy and optimism that people really need right now. Not least from musicians who by and large need to play every day just to make ends meet. But artists survive on more than just their modest recompense. They need to feed the soul. That's Brian Benning Hove, saxophonist and founder of the Jersey City Jazz Festival, canceled this year by COVID-19. Blowing outside of Moore's Lounge in Jersey City, the rare live venue here, which has taken its Meet the Artist series onto the street. How does it feel to finally be out doing stuff in front of people? Oh, it's great. Felt really good to break some windows with the guys and, um, and also to see everybody out there and just to see the community 
what was so great is like it's just no frills it was just about the music and coming together and it was just so happy i felt so good for a couple days after that so from 900 car parking lots to street corners rock and roll classical and jazz music is coming back and in this uncertain world it's reassuring to know that one voice can make everything seem possible JTV News, I'm David. That does it for us tonight, but head over to njtvnews.org and njspotlight.com for all of our latest reporting on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire team. Thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. The Orsted vision is a world that runs entirely on green energy. Located off the coast of Atlantic City, Orsted's Ocean Wind Project will provide renewable offshore wind energy. Jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey.